the Operations Research Society of South Africa. Uh, and we've got two presenters there. It is Dr. Lishan Fenter. Uh, Lishan is a researcher and lecturer of Operations Research and Business Analytics in the Department of Logistics at Stellenbosch University. She holds a PhD in Operations Research and her dissertation is a System Dynamics Analysis of the South African Basic Education System for Decision Intelligence and Policy Recommendation. She is the founder and and director of the Systems Thinking for Education Policy, uh, STEP research group, which developed, which developed for from a concern about the declining quality of basic education within the South African system, and a special concern for the growing inequalities in academic opportunities. Dr. Fenter is the secretary of the Operations Research Society of South Africa, and a proud representative of this of the this Society of Decision Scientists. She's going to be joined by uh, Mr. David Clark. He's the president of the Operations Research Society. He holds the MSc in Computer Science and is a member of the IEEE and ACM. David has been involved in the design and implementation of software systems for the logistics industry since 1997. And he has experience in the development and implementation of routing and scheduling optimization based systems and consulting engagements for companies in supply chain studies. He's done work on simulations for the mining industry, workflow integration in the insurance in the sector, and helps on new projects in high-speed scalable cloud-based optimization services. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Lishan and David. Uh, thanks, Andres. Can you, can you hear me? We can hear you clearly. Great, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, unfortunately, I run on a Linux box and Teams does not play nicely with Linux. Okay, so, but we uh, can see your presentation. So <laughs> I, I hope you can see that. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, just going to run this out of my browser, so I hope everyone's okay with that. But thanks very much for the, the introduction. And, and thanks very much for giving uh, the Operations Research Society uh, an opportunity to present uh, some of what we're doing and, uh, and the ideas around operations research. And so I thought I would, uh, Alicia is going to talk more specifically around the role of simulation in, in, in our society, but I thought I'd give a bit of an overview of, of, of the society and of operations research as a whole. Um, looking at three sort of aspects, you know, OR, OR is, uh, itself, um, the, the idea of societies and, and why societies and associations I think are important, and then the South African context. So I think just to to start with, um, you know, you know, OR is a lot like I think AI is today, right? Every every time you try and define it, there's everyone has a slightly different idea of what it what it means to do operations research and there is a very strong sort of um, academic uh, set of disciplines that are taught under operations research but when it comes to industry uh, things get a bit more fuzzy uh, and so i think it's always useful to look at, at how these fields started and um, operations research and to some degree computer science you know came out of or computers at least came out of world war ii Operations research has its beginnings really in World War One, which is kind of prior to there being any large uh, computers available. Um, and and the classic example was when they were trying to schedule and understand how to do um, convoys uh, in the presence of uh, submarine attacks. Uh, and for the first time. Uh, commanders were saying, you know, why, how, how do we, how do we improve our, our operational process? Um, because there were these, you know, teams of people who were trying to plan and who were trying to allocate resources. And it, it, there was this realization that, that surely there were, there were better tools and there were more effective techniques that could be used to not only come up with better solutions, but also to manage these problem solving teams. And, and that kind of then extends into World War II where we, we, we kind of really think of the birth of, 
operations research um, in the planning of of different um, different problems and, and and another classic one in World War II was the allocation of radar stations and so uh, you know war has this 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 thing of just speeding people along because the consequences of, of, of failure are so high um, and we slowly start to see uh, this idea that the, the the powerful techniques that already existed in terms of, of mathematical modeling could start to be applied to more uh, less science and engineering fields and more to the operations of business and in this particular case uh, war. Um, and so coming out into the 50s um, people we're taking those ideas and the teams that had been involved in World War II and were saying, well, you know, that that seems like a really good approach. Can we not use these techniques, these optimization techniques that were coming out um, and that had been really put to really effective use during World War II, um, particularly around like Danzig and his simplex method. Um, can we now have tools that allow us to model problems and find optimal solutions or at least feasible solutions for spaces in in uh, industry itself? Um, and so basically, we come out to like you know, well, war is hard. We, I agree with that. Um, we see it all the time still, unfortunately. But to be fair, just about everything else is hard too these days, um, and certainly not just now, but in the past as well. Um, and so this this idea of um, uh, and and like the system dynamics people saying like you know we, we need to provide people with um, access and awareness to some really powerful techniques that are available out there in order to help them solve whether it's problems in in logistics which is where I I work specifically or in scheduling planning allocation. Um, there's there's problems all over that, that need to be addressed, uh, and the idea of optimization and uh, and decision processes is is really key to operations research. It's it's really like how how do we make good decisions? They, they, you know there's this growing sort of uh, uh, line of complexity where you have um, the people have, have often referred to where you have descriptive analytics, which is showing you you know what's happening now. You know, I'm sitting in the car, you know, what's on my dashboard? That's a sort of descriptive view of my world. And then there's predictive analytics, which is saying, um, you know, what what do I expect to happen? Right. I'm, I'm looking out the windshield. I'm looking at the windshield. I'm looking in my rearview mirror and I'm, I'm seeing things. You know, what what do I think is going to happen next? And then there's the prescriptive side, which really falls into where OR tools are often used in terms of optimization theory, simulation, and uh, game theory for that matter as well, which then try to say, well, given these two things, what I'm seeing now and what I think will happen, what do I do? This is a very difficult problem and, and something that is still, um, people struggle to face um, these issues, even when they've got good, good tools that are providing them with thousands of predictive scenarios going into the future. They still struggle to say, well, which of these should I, I really pick given my, my current objectives? Um, and as we've seen, it's it's a the field continues to grow. I always say to people, like, you should never worry about running out of problems in this space. Like, like the, every time you solve one problem, another one pops up that was even harder than before. Uh, and, and our problem is not so much that they aren't enough problems out there for us to solve, it's that they're just not enough people to 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 work on these things and push them further. So I think in that in that aspect, um, coming back to the society, just creating this awareness of, of um, the fact that yes, we, we we have tools to tackle these problems and we should be doing it. And uh, the more people that we can get involved uh, in thinking in these ways, the better. Um, New tools and techniques are, are constantly coming out and, and the ideas of being able to validate and verify your results is also becoming more important. Um, we, we do a lot of optimization again, uh, speaking back to routing and scheduling where we produce routes. 
but nowadays there's also um, growing interest in uh, running simulations on top of those routes to, to um, inject uh, issues that, that weren't part of the original optimization program itself because sometimes it's, it's difficult to capture all the constraints in these problems and often as you know the more constraints you capture the longer it takes to, to, to come up with a solution, the less likelihood that you can find an optimal solution. And this, um, especially in the time that, that's required, and, uh, and sometimes this idea of, of running simulations to then uh, inject more real world constraints or more uh, um, dynamic uh, uncertainty into the system is, is becoming uh, quite an interesting field as well. Um, once, once you have a, a, a solution, you still have to monitor, you still have to execute it. Um, and so coming up with a successful solution isn't just about a good model or a good mathematical technique. It's about a, a team of people that need to understand what the, the, the key objective is and be working together to, um, to make that possible. We did some interesting work uh, with Transnet quite some time ago, and while the optimization aspect of it was was really challenging and interesting, um, or as much of a challenge was was um, the the sort of business reengineering aspect and and trying to get the team to understand, you know, to trust the results, uh, to understand what type when they should raise questions about the results. Uh, you know, at first people are very skeptical of, of results that come out of uh, planning systems and then they become too compliant. So at first they question everything and then after a while of using it, they question nothing. Neither of these two things work, uh, work particularly well. Um, you, you, need, you need your planners and people using these systems to constantly be critical, but in an informed way. Um, and so as we move forward, um, I think the, the future is very exciting, right? I mean, for all of us working in these fields, um, I think uh, making better decisions is, is, is what we all want. Uh, you know, do, do we keep humans in the loop? That's another interesting question. We have a lot of autonomous systems now making decisions for us. Um, uh, I think in the, the high speed uh, trading world, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, autonomous uh, trading transactions being done. You know, how are those decisions being made? Uh, it leads on to questions of ethics and uh, and and how do we make sure that members of our of our groups are, are acting in ethical ways? You, you can do very good optimization for good and, and I'm sure you can you can, you know, optimize things that are bad. Um, I suppose things like recommendation systems could almost fall into that these days and especially the ads you see. Um, that, that can possibly have consequences that we don't uh, see. I don't want to take up all Ishan's time. Sorry, I've been going a bit slowly. Um, it's just, uh, it's a very exciting field. I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, the society is part of a broader international group called the International Federation of Operations Research Societies. It started in 59. Currently 54 members, there are 193 uh, UN states. Um, so, you know, I feel, uh, as Mike Trick said a couple of years ago, we've still got a long way in, in pushing the message of what these tools can do. Um, uh, they also have um, two journals that come out that cover broadly a lot of what operations research does. Um, we also are members of Euro, started in 1976, um, the countries in green. Oh, sorry, they're not 52 members, there's about 24 members. That is a that is a mistake, um, but uh, and they they publish a lot of really good journals as well. The European Journal of Operations Research is a fantastic one for getting a broad overview of the fields that operations research uh, working. Uh, and then more recently, we've got um, uh, AFROS, which is the African Federation of Operations Research Societies. This was founded by uh, ourselves, uh, Tunisia and Nigeria and as well as a few other member societies and that's been been growing really well. I think um, this is one place where we um, where we have been needing to make further work and so um, the, the
the group in that team has been doing really well. Our vice chair, Dave Evans, is the current uh, president of AFROS. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities there for people to communicate and to connect with other people in their specific disciplines. And then just very lastly, obviously Operations Research Society, please visit our website. There's lots of great information there, mostly put up by Leeshan. Thanks, Leeshan. Um, and we have our own journal. So um, yeah, uh, exciting times and thanks for giving me uh, a few moments to, uh, to give you some idea of what Operations Research is about. I'll I'll let Leeshan take the take the last few minutes of this slot. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Um, I will sort of share my own slides and then you don't have to do the share from your side. Great, thanks. Uh, I think you can just share it from where you are. Is it sharing OK? Yeah, that's great. Everything <laughs> looks fine, thank you. OK, perfect. So um, yes, thank you, David, for that overview of the society. So now you would have seen on our website that the um, our slogan is that we are the home for um, decision intelligence. So anybody that is trying to, to use all of these techniques that David has described for better decisions is welcome in OSHA. And especially um, OSHA is also the home for simulation modelers. And so I want to just take a, a few minutes to introduce you to some of the modelers that we have, some of the projects that we've been featuring in the society so that you can get a feeling for how welcome you are also um, within the society. So, um, at the Department of Logistics, for example, we have a research group um, led by Dr. Linka Potrite, and um, she uses uh, discrete event simulation. For example, one application is in production management. And in this study, she worked with a student to use the discrete event simulation to shorten the time of dairy products. Um, that the, the products actually spend in the production factory. Now the student has gone on to work for ShopRite, um, so using those skills now, and two of the promising scenarios that they showed uh, could uh, optimize the system is the installation of blast freezers, for example, and the installation of additional wrapping machine in um, the packing area. So they used uh, AnyLogic and built um, the simulation model so but the her group is not only just interested in discrete event simulation but also in agent-based simulation so here's one application this is actually uh, dr potrita's research field is that she's in agricultural management so the same group also uses agent-based simulation modeling for the agricultural management she worked with um, dr brian van feeden and Samantha Downing, who's also at, at shop right now, and they specifically use it as a, a possible means for accurately capturing the behavior of a very specific pest in the crops called Aldona saccharina. And by employing simulation modeling, control strategies may be tested to assess their anticipated success in eradicating the pest. So we have simulation modelers in the production environment. We have simulation modelers in the agricultural um, environment. Then we are also um, affiliated with Marsha, which is um, Professor Sheetal Salal's simulation research group. So Marsha is short for the Modeling and Simulation Hub of Africa, and it's a research group at the University of Cape Town. And Marsha's research focus is the development and application of mathematical modeling and specifically agent-based simulation to predict the dynamics and control of infectious diseases to evaluate the impact of their policies. Now we were super proud because um, Professor Salal is a member of OSA and she was selected for the South African COVID-19 modeling consortium uh, which directly advised the South African government at presidential and cabinet level on the uh, pandemic control strategy. And for her work in, in this advisory role, she won the Category 2 award at Orsa, uh, which is the recognition 
to a current member of ORSA for a single outstanding achievement with respect to the practice of operations research at national level. So why I'm showing you this is to show that ORSA has a deep appreciation for the work of simulation modelers and that we do acknowledge them um, in, our, in our awards and in our collaboration. And we have so much respect for our simulation modelers that this year our premier award model, uh, award medal, which is our Tom Roswidovsky medal, was won again by two simulation modelers, um, this time using an agent-based approach for migration management. Um, and this is from the Sun Or Group, which is also at Stellenbosch University. So it's the Stellenbosch University Unit for Operations Research. And they are a research group for complex, dynamic, stochastic systems using computer simulation with the aim of optimizing system performance. And they're based within Stellenbosch University Industrial Engineering. So the, the winning paper was Modeling Forced Migration, a framework for conflict-induced forced migration modeling according to an agent-based approach. And um, there you see our president, David Clark, handing over the medal to the simulation modeler. That's uh, Professor Jan van Fieden. So um, it's, it's, it's been a, a good um, few years for, for acknowledging the importance of simulation modeling in a society as transdisciplinary as OSHA. Then maybe more specifically of interest to this group, um, as Anders read in my bio, this is my research group that I have at the Stellenbosch, at uh, the Department of Logistics at Stellenbosch University. So we use um, systems thinking and system dynamic simulation modeling specifically to model the South African basic education system. So I also teach a course on system dynamics at honors level. And then from there, I find my, my strongest uh, research assistants, the students, and then from there we have uh, PhDs and master's degrees and honors projects and um, the um, here we use uh, the, 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 the strength of system dynamics and um, systems thinking to try and understand this insane black box of dysfunctionality that we have in our basic education system. So we also combine our models um, with agent based approach. So we're very grateful for um, platforms that allow us to build these hybrid models and I um, I'm quite proud of the pioneering work that we are doing to combine system dynamics models with agent based models. Um, and we're specifically doing that in any logic currently, but we're also looking um, at NetLogo to combine these models and then to get the, the strength of um, both of the paradigms. And um, as a system dynamicist, as a member of OSHA, I feel so welcome in the community and I feel so um, welcome in the society because what I find is. Um, at our last conference, we had um, Susara. Uh, no, sorry, I wanted to thank Susara um, Groblor to be here because she was one of our keynote speakers. But then there was also Professor Lisa Skolton, and she was explaining how difficult it is with transdisciplinary research um, because you, as a system dynamicist, you have all of the qualitative modeling that you bring together, but then in an age where we really have to collaborate with quantitative uh, professionals to inform our models and to, especially with the speed of with which data science and artificial intelligence needs to inform the statistical um, validation of our causal links. It's such a good place to find quantitative colleagues with which to collaborate and to strengthen the, the statistical believability and um, the mathematical rigor of my system dynamics models. So that is one of the big benefits that I found with being a system dynamicist as a member of OSA is the close collaboration that I have with um, my quantitative colleagues to strengthen and inform my qualitative models. So here's my call. Um, in 2022, we've started to establish special interest groups in uh, OSHA, and we have a data science special interest group under Professor Kanchukan Rajaratnam from the School of Decision Science at um, Stellenbosch University. And we also have a special interest group in quantitative finance. So now what we're very interested in is establishing a special interest group in system dynamics within OSHA. And um, so my call is that we're looking for a head for this 
special interest group. So if you are keen to join the society, we can onboard you very quickly if you have a four year qualification in the modeling. And if you have at least two years experience in the modeling, then we would love to welcome you and maybe head up Orsa's new special interest group to, to increase collaboration between Orsa and the system dynamics um, chapter of South Africa. Um, so uh, let me quickly show you if you want to find out more about this. Let me just share the website quickly. Sorry, just a second. Let me go and I just want to share uh, that one. If you want to find out, then you can just visit orsa.org.za and then under membership, you will find the special interest groups. And here, potentially uh, could be the next adventure for you for 2022 where you join us as, as the head of our system dynamics um, special interest group and you are welcome to contact me to find out about more and we are happy to take any questions about the society and about the special interest group. Thank you David and Lisha. Uh, are there any questions from the floor? So I do a Russian volunteer again. <laughs> you, you, and you. So, so I'm not going to pick on, on on Rudolf again. So the rest of you better be prepared. Question in the chat from JP. Yes. Oh, that's a question for you, Lisa. Um. Yes. So I I love any logic. Um. It is fantastic that the price is just starting to get me down in this economic downturn of exchange rates. And so I've had to start looking at open source solutions and the best open source solution so far that I found is NetLogo. The thing is NetLogo is very much, um, it's a much lower level. So it's not as drag and drop and click and pull and you have your little icons and things. It's very, you, you script, you, you program in scripting language. So right now, all of the functionality you have in any logic is in NetLogo. So whatever you would have wanted to do in, in any of the uh, corporate softwares you can do in NetLogo, you just need to um, uh, check on your, your uh, programming proficiency again, because now you're back to like, manually setting up your arrays, manually setting up. So right now I'm, I'm using it more for the agent based approach uh, just because it's more statistical. Um, but yeah, if you can't afford any of these stellars or any of these any logics, then, then you better. But if you are struggling, then I would recommend NetLogo as the best open source solution. Thank you for that, Lucian. Uh, and if you find your your head of the SIG, please let us know because we need to meet this person. He can walk on water or she. Uh, so thank you very much for introducing also. Uh, we really appreciate that. And yes, we will talk to you guys and see how we can collaborate because it's interesting. I think Australia have got a network, so all the different disciplines in uh, simulation and decision support actually form part of a single uh, national network there. So again, thank you very much.